Good morning. This will be the last Sunday that uh, the folks from Abiding Savior will be sharing in this worship venue. We're particularly grateful for the congregation here at St. John's in sharing this venue with us and for Pastor Jamie's accommodation for us. Uh, next week we will have live worship at Abiding Savior at 1030 in the morning. We're going to try it. it this will not be a permanent thing. It's a one-time shot. It will be my last Sunday with them as I go into retirement. So we will be worshiping live at Abiding Savior next Sunday at 1030, and we are hopeful that uh, soon thereafter we will be able to return to some kind of normal uh, worship activity. And now we begin our worship for today. We begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, whose steadfast love is everlasting, whose faithfulness endures from generation to generation. Amen. Trusting in the mercy of God, let us confess our sin. Reconciling God, we confess that we do not trust your abundance, and we deny your presence in our lives. We place our hope in ourselves and rely on our own efforts. We fail to believe that you provide enough for all. We abuse your good creation for our own benefit. We fear difference and do not welcome others as you have welcomed us. We sin in thought, word, and deed. By your grace, forgive us. Through your love, renew us. And in your spirit, lead us so that we may live and serve you in newness of life. Amen. Beloved of God, by the radical abundance of divine mercy, we have peace with God through Christ Jesus, through whom we have obtained grace upon grace. Our sins are forgiven. Let us live now in hope, for hope does not disappoint, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Teach us, good Lord God, to serve you as you deserve, to give and not to count the cost, to fight and not to heed the wounds, to toil and not to seek for rest, to labor and not to ask for reward, except that of knowing that we do your will, through Jesus Christ our Savior and Lord. Amen. Our first lesson this morning is from the sixth chapter of the book of Romans. Should we continue in sin in order that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who have died to sin go on living in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him by baptism into death so that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be destroyed and we might no longer be enslaved to sin. For whoever has died is freed from sin. But if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. How do you face life? We live in a broken world, and we always have. The riots and the unrest in our society are descriptive of that brokenness. Our society is so ready to blame, to condemn. Those who are different from us have always been under suspicion. We've put up with abuses by a few in the police for many years. The church calls this situation sin. All of us are caught up in the sin. 
You and I live in a society that is flawed and biased, and we're wrestling with all of this on top of all of these weeks of being cooped up together. It's no wonder we're stressed. No wonder that all kinds of change and uncertainty stand before us, looming over us. And then we begin to contemplate the future. Never have we had so much time in our hands or so many fears of what their future might bring. As reopening unfolds, what will be next? Adjustments and change are not over by a long shot. So just plain coping takes on new meaning. How we are to face life is an essential question that challenges us daily. For those of us with a faith, com faith commitment, we hear about this God of grace and mercy, and we depend upon that grace to carry us through all of these uncertain days. St. Paul addresses the issue for the congregation in Rome. He describes how in Christ we have a fresh start. We're not locked into the past, not bound by sin. Life is new and possible because due to our baptism, we are linked to Christ's death and resurrection. So we're dead to sin, but we're alive to God in Christ Jesus. And so we live, we face life because God has provided a savior for us. And in our baptism, we are joined to Christ. The brokenness of our world, the corruption that we see in our culture, is not the final word. It is not even the dominating power over us. What Jesus Christ has provided in our baptism is a linkage to the living God and to our Savior, a linkage that cannot be broken. We face the future. We face change. Knowing that we are secure in the love and the mercy of this God of ours, it is not necessary for us to know what is coming. We can rest comfortably in God's mercy, no matter what. The unknown has no power over us, since we are linked to God's love and his care. And since we know that we are claimed and named by this God in our baptism, we can adjust and we can adapt to face all things. That's the good news of the gospel. It's how we face life. It's how we face the future. We are confident that God's love to, for us in Christ is sufficient, adequate to carry us no matter what. Thanks be to God. Amen. Morning. Our gospel today comes from Matthew, the 10th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said to the 12, a disciple is not above the teacher, nor a slave above the master. It is enough for the disciple to be like the teacher and the slave to be like the master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more will they malign those of his household? So have no fear of them. For nothing is covered up that will not be uncovered, and nothing secret that will not become known. What I say to you in the dark, tell in the light, and what you hear whispered, proclaim from the housetops. Do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father and even the hairs of your head are counted. So do not be afraid. You are more valuable than many sparrows. Everyone, therefore, who acknowledges me before others, I will acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever denies me before others, I will also deny before my Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace but a sword. For I have come to set man against his father, and daughter against his mother, and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law, and one's foes will be members of one's own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. 
And whoever does not take up the cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Those who find their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake will find it. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. I want to take a moment to, uh, to thank the, the folks of Abiding Savior for, uh, for joining us here at St. John's over these past uh, few months. And I know that you are in good hands moving forward. Uh, we're a part of a club now together and that we have done this uh, together for several months and now both, uh, both St. John's and Abiding Savior have gotten to wish Pastor Scarfia well as he heads into retirement. Uh, we must not have done it well enough here at St. John's because it didn't stick. And so we're trusting you uh, to do better than we were able to do. Uh, what that means for St. John's is that next week we will begin our drive-in services. We're gonna start those a week early. And the way that will work is um, in our large parking lot across the street, uh, you'll park facing the church and tune into uh, 101.5 on the radio and you'll hear me coming over that. We're also working on connecting a keyboard uh, to our system so that uh, uh, Vicki can resume playing, uh, playing for us. And uh, we'll continue that way um, uh, as we assess how best to move forward. We'll still be doing an online service that'll be live streamed after we do the drive-in service. So the drive-in service will be at nine and the live stream will be after that. There are different uh, types of, of sermons that you can do. There are those that, uh, that challenge you, uh, that, that leave, where you leave feeling a bit uncomfortable, where you leave feeling like there's uh, uh, you're reminded in particular of those places where you need to grow. And there are also uh, sermons that uplift, sermons that encourage on the, the journey so far and the strength to move ahead in the journey to come. Given the, uh, the contentious week uh, and weeks that we've had and the, the stresses uh, that we've had as, as we've gone through uh, division in our country, and as we've gone through the pandemic, and, and the fact that today is Father's Day, happy Father's Day to everyone, by the way, I thought this would be a great week to do an uplifting sermon. I think that we could use a little encouragement. And so I looked at what the gospel had to say, and it said, for I have come to set man against his father, and daughter against her mother, and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law, and one's foes will be members of one's old household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he began that whole thing by saying, do not think I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but the sword. Sounds like that uplifting thing might be a little harder to do than I thought. Because in, in the gospel, in Jesus' teachings, I do not know that we come to a reading where he challenges us more than in this reading. And it seems so counter to who we understand Jesus to be. I mean, one of the names we have for Jesus is the Prince of Peace. We have, we have a church in our, own, uh, in our own conference here that's named Prince of Peace Lutheran Church. And yet here he says, I have not come to bring peace but the sword. And what better Father's Day message could there be than I have come to set man against his father? You know, as, as, as I was reading that, and, and in particular thinking of my own relationship with my son, I don't know what would lead us to that point. Uh, for, for those that, uh, that, have seen, um, that have seen Drake and I uh, together, you'll notice that we're pretty tight. Uh, when uh, when my birthday or when Father's Day rolls around, usually he's, uh, his, his, his great aspiration is to lead the service with me on those days, to, to help me on Father's Day and to help me on my birthday. And he stands right by my side. And when I raise my hand for the benediction, he raises his little hand for the benediction. When he was little, he would stand behind me at the communion uh, table and you would just see little hands poking up from behind the table. So what would lead son and father to be set against one another? I, I, I know I'm not the only one that has that sort of relationship with their son. 
and of course I know that uh, that mothers and daughters and uh, and in-laws even to, despite the despite all the jokes that might be made these are people who love each other and get along and as I was thinking about what is being said here it made me think of a phrase that has, that seems to have come up a lot lately among people who love one another which is I guess we'll have to agree to disagree. Now, now that's a phrase that is, uh, is very helpful with, when you're talking about things like ice cream, right? Like, uh, I, I like vanilla ice cream, you like chocolate, I guess we'll have to agree to disagree. Maybe we'll just get Neapolitan and we'll have to find someone else to eat the strawberry. Right? Or, you know, e even with some things that are, we'll say, a step higher in importance, right? I, I like the Bills, and you like a team from New England, we'll just have to agree to disagree. But when it comes to Jesus and the message that Jesus was teaching to his disciples and to the crowds gathered in Israel, Jesus wasn't much for the we'll have to agree to disagree sort of thing. Jesus didn't agree to disagree with anyone. Jesus was firm in his convictions. He raised them up, and quite honestly, he condemned those that disagreed. Right, those are the folks that he would say, it would have been better if you had not been born at all than to have been a stumbling block to my children. The, the, the folks who he calls a brood of vipers or, or any of those other sorts of uh, names, it's the folks whose tables Jesus was angrily turning over in the marketplace. He didn't say, well, I don't think you should desecrate my father's house, and you think it's okay to desecrate my father's house. I guess we'll just agree to disagree. Jesus made a whip and chased those folks out. The truth is that, uh, that when it comes to things like ice cream or, or football teams or the best shortcut to take to, to get somewhere, it's fine to agree to disagree. But something Jesus was quite clear on is that the morals that he was taking, the, the, the morality that he was showing, the way of the Father that he was teaching, is not something to be disagreed on. It's something to be followed. And if you fail to follow it, that, that failure is to be repented of. That when Jesus taught something, it wasn't just a recommendation, it wasn't just a, a good encouragement, it wasn't just one way to do something. That was God's way to lead us towards the kingdom. And so I guess that that gets back to that uh, son being set against father and mother against daughter and one's own household will be, uh, will be where the enemies are. I think Jesus knew, I know Jesus knew, that his message was going to be challenging for some to take, for some to hear. And I think Jesus knew that as he was teaching folks the imperative nature of his gospel, that, that would mean that there could be tension, even in one's own household. A as you think of, of Jesus as he's teaching and preaching, he he's reaching out to the marginalized, right? A in some cases, it's the marginalized who are, are there by their own choices or, or circumstances, uh, like the tax collectors, right? And Jesus reaches out to them, says, Repent of the extortion that you're doing to the people and join my flock. Or, or on the other hand, it, would, uh, it could be just those folks who are marginalized just because of the circumstances of their birth. Uh, like the Samaritans, right? These are, these are people who are, are different than us. They, they're, they're from the other side of, uh, of the tracks. They, they, they worship on a different mountain than we do. They're bad people because of that. And Jesus reached out to them too and pointed out the humanity that they had, the value that they had, and shared the gospel with them as well. And I think that Jesus knew that there would be households where the son might come home and the father would say, have you been interacting with tax collectors? Not in my house. Not in my house will I have someone who would interact with someone like that. And the son would say, 
All of us are, are created by God. All of us are loved by God. The sacrifice that Jesus made, that he taught as, as he was going through Israel, these people matter. The, you know, we, we encourage this tax collector to repent, to rejoin his people, and here he is. And when it comes to that sort of question, that father and that son, they can't just agree to disagree. Right? The, the son is living into that gospel calling. And the father, if, if the father cannot understand that, well, that's not something that the son is called to easily set aside and say, well, okay, I choose family unity over the gospel of Christ. That's a hard lesson to take. Because in this world, there is plenty of divisions. And then the question becomes for us, which of these is a better grasp of where the gospel is leading us than I do? We can't agree to disagree. I have to struggle and to strive to understand where he is coming from, understand his point of view, and realize that I have to change my own. The alternative to that is just us disagreeing, and neither of us want that. God doesn't want that. And so Jesus is the Prince of Peace. But that peace does not come at the cost of choosing peace over choosing the gospel. The gospel comes first. The message of Jesus comes first. And when that causes division, that causes division. Now I told you at the outset of this that I wanted this sermon to be something that uplifted. And I guess here's the uplifting encouragement I'll leave you with. The next time someone you care about and you have a difference of opinion on something, I encourage you to see it from their point of view. To, to take efforts to, to see where they're coming from and to see if the gospel is speaking from their point of view. To see where your own point of view might be limited. And pray that they do the same. And that together, seeing things from one another's side of view, finding where the gospel is in that, and following that, even if it means that your way is wrong or their way is wrong, when we do that, we advance towards the kingdom. And we have advanced towards that kingdom by doing just that over the years. We still have a long way to go. But we can achieve that goal. We can find the kingdom of God in this world by setting aside our desire for peace, by setting aside even family unity, by setting those things aside and following the gospel, all of us can move forward together. And I guess the benefit of family is that even when we disagree, even when one of us needs to change our point of view, we'll still be there to love and care for one another. The gospel leads us forward. Our love is stronger than our division. That is the uplifting message. That's the hope. Do you want to say amen for me? Amen. amen.
I picked that hymn for two reasons. One, it of course uh, uh, proclaims the story of, uh, of following the gospel and, and marching forward towards it. But the other reason is when I was quite little, um, I, I had to have been four or so, I was at Hills. Do you remember Hills? Uh, it was the one on the corner of Transit and Main, uh, where the Barnes and Noble is now. And uh, uh, we were in the checkout line and I loudly started singing Onward Christian Soldiers. I was there with my mother and my grandmother and my aunt, my, my godmother, uh, who was only about 16 at the time. And my mother left me and my grandmother left me as I loudly sang and as the checkout people uh, glared at me. Uh, and, and, and only my aunt, uh, who I think just felt obligated to not abandon the small child, stuck with me. And so uh, I suppose in a fun way of saying, Sometimes our proclaiming the gospel might scare some people away, but our love will bring us back together. My family still let me in the car. Let us confess our faith in God who calls us forward in the gospel and holds us together in love with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, he was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Awesome. Called into unity with one another and the whole creation, let us pray for our shared world. O Holy One, you bring us together and call us your own. Bless theologians, teachers, and preachers who help us to grow in the faith. Guide your church that we might be a holy people. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Holy One, the whole earth is yours. Where there is fire, bring cool air and new growth. Where there is flooding, bring abatement. Where there is drought, bring rain. Inspire us to care for what you have provided. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Holy One, we have created divisions you will not own. In places of conflict, raise up leaders who work to develop lasting peace and reconciliation. Encourage organizations and individuals who care for all forced to leave their homes. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Holy One, you care for those who are harassed and helpless. Protect and defend those who are abused. Heal those who are sick. Feed all who hunger. Empower all whose voices go unheard. And help us respond to the pressing needs of our neighbor. Today we especially pray for Robert, Katie, Hannah, Anna, Bob, Michelle, Wanda, Bet, Thelma, Patty, David, Clifford, Renee, Jan, Dorothy, Bonnie, Vic and Carol, Jason, Bernie, Jeffrey, Jim and Nancy, Barbara, Tammy, Rosemary, Nathan, Rick and Nancy, Stella, Sue, Stanley, Suzanne, Elena, Lewis, Bill, Ruth, Marty, Becky, Jim, Nina, Diane, Dan and Paula, and Dino. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Holy One, you provide a plentiful harvest of gifts and resources. Prepare us to labor and gather the fruits of this congregation that we might discover new ways of living. Minister to us in our work that we do not lose heart. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Holy One, you bring all people to yourself. 
we give thanks for the, for the holy people who have gone before us. Sustain us in your mission until the day that you bear us up to join the saints in light. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Receive these prayers, O God, and those too deep for words, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. May the peace of the Lord be with you all. We'll meet again Don't know when Don't know when But I know we'll meet again Some sunny day Keep smiling through just like you always do till the blue skies drive the dark clouds far away so will you please say hello to the folks that i know tell them i won't be long they'll be happy to know that as you saw me go, I was singing this song. We meet again, don't know when, don't know when, but I know we'll meet again some sunny day. Remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. God the Creator, Jesus the Christ, and the Holy Spirit the Comforter bless you and keep you in eternal love. Amen. Go in peace, serve the Lord. We will. Thanks be to God. Amen. Bye, everyone.